This video is protein structure two. So we're going to talk about several different types of bonds that are found within proteins. These bonds are all types of interactions, actually. So bonds is not such a great name for them. And they're all between the side chains of the amino acids. Mm -hmm. So in particular, again, these are between side chains of the amino acids. And bonds is not such a great term. Interactions is better. Um, and the reason for this is all of these are non-covalent interactions. There are four we're going to talk about. The first one is hydrogen bonds, often called H bonds. The second one is electrostatic interactions. you may have heard of in other classes as ionic bonds. A third type of interaction is the van der Waals attractions. And you may have heard some talk of these in the chemistry course as a London dispersion force. I will call them van der Waals attractions, though. And finally, uh, hydrophobic interactions. Again, all of these are non-covalent bonds. So the electrons are not shared between the atoms that are interacting with each other. Uh, whereas for a covalent bond, of course, they would be shared electrons. These are weaker than covalent bonds individually. Just kind of for your information, we're talking about the scale of about 20 of these uh, interactions uh, adding up to the same strength as a single covalent bond. Uh, there's a lot of variation across them for the different types, though, so that's not a number you specifically need to know. Uh, however, know that when you have enough of these interactions that they can uh, provide some very serious uh, structure and stability, uh, but individually they are uh, nowhere near as strong as a covalent bond. Okay, so we're going to look at all four of those interactions in more detail here. Um, a really nice reference is pages 78 to 79 of your textbook. And also this figure, which is figure 4-4, shows the first three of them. And I want to explain a little bit about what this figure is showing, since we're going to spend some time with it. Uh, so basically, if you start here in the middle, notice there's this gray squiggle. This is the backbone of a polypeptide chain. And then we can see there's one, two, three different sorts of interactions shown here. And off to each side, they're going to blow up um, each of those types of interactions. So um, in those cases, we'll see in gray uh, the backbone chain, including the peptide bonds and the other atoms that are involved. Uh, typically, we'll see that is, um, as you've seen on the amino acid structure previously, carbons, carbons, and nitrogens all in a chain. And then the side chains are what's interesting that's going to participate in these interactions and allows this particular protein to stay folded in this way. Instead of being flat and long in this direction, these particular interactions are stabilizing it and holding it in a particular shape. Okay, so we're going to start off with hydrogen bonds. Uh, so we'll check that out over here. Uh, so basically what you can see is for hydrogen bond, um, again, this is not between a hydrogen and a hydrogen. Hydrogen bonds are between a hydrogen atom, and that hydrogen atom would have a partial positive charge due to electronegativity across um, other bonds. Um, in this case, we see that the hydrogen that's involved in this hydrogen bond is bonded to a nitrogen. There's a, um, a high electrical electronegativity difference between them, and so then um, hydrogen ends up with a partial positive. 
Um, and then oxygen um, is typically going to hold on very strongly to its electrons, especially when it's bonded to carbon. And so uh, the oxygen that's shown here has a partial negative charge. And so this hydrogen bond, which is these red uh, dashed lines here, that is the interaction between the partial positive and the partial negative. So this hydrogen bond is between a hydrogen atom with a partial positive charge and another atom that has a partial negative charge. Uh, for example, in this case, it's oxygen. Another common one that you'll see is nitrogen. And in other textbooks, you may have seen the hydrogen bond uh, shown as a little um, dashed kind of little dots. Um, and again, for this textbook, they use these longer red lines. So be on the lookouts for those. Uh, so let's talk about the second type of bond that's depicted here. That's electrostatic interactions. And the big thing here is to see that this is between full charges. And in particular, if we look at this in detail, um, notice that we've got our backbone here. Um, this is particularly focusing on the amino acid glutamic acid. And here we see the side chain, the side chain of glutamic acid. You don't have, the, have to have, have this memorized, but notice it has a negative charge here, full negative charge. And then on this other portion of the protein, there's a lysine um, amino acid. Here's the um, variable group for lysine that's protruding off um, from that backbone. And you see a full positive charge on the nitrogen. So the electrostatic or ionic uh, bond in between that full negative and full positive um, is shown here. Then the third type of interaction that's shown in this figure is the van der Waals attractions. Uh, this is kind of a, a curious concept initially, um, and let's talk a little bit about it over here. So basically, van der Waals attractions form due to fluctuating electrical charges within an atom. These are random electrical charges which form, and they're also random and temporary. And this produces things that have a positive or negative charge um, in certain portions or pockets of the atom. And basically, that could happen for each of the atoms um, that are participating in the van der Waals attraction. And a van der Waals attraction occurs when there are two atoms that have opposing charges. Uh, these temporary random charges and um, are very close together. In, uh, physical proximity. And you can see there's a big cluster of those across these different methyl groups, which are part of uh, the side chains of the amino acids in the backbone here. In particular, they're highlighting valine, alanine, um, and valine, which have these methyl groups that are forming um, van der Waals attractions between them. Now on to the last of the non-covalent interactions, and that's the hydrophobic forces. Uh, and basically, now um, on this particular diagram again, in gray you're going to see the backbone um, of the polypeptide chains. Now we're zooming out a little bit so we can see the different uh, side chains, and they're just color-coded, same color coding that we saw on our last videos. Um, and basically the nonpolar side chains are um, shown in green, and basically notice they're speckled along this whole length of uh, the polypeptide chain. And so initially when it's unfolded, then the protein um, just kind of is hanging out there, no particular really stabilized shape, and in the polar side chains are shown in the other colors, yellow, red, um, and uh, blue. And basically as protein folding occurs, then um, we see that this more stabilized structure has formed, and notice that there's little hydrogen bonds off to the side with the polar side chains. It's described by this little blurb here. And for hydrophobic forces, we're paying attention to this cluster of side chains that are all in the center of the protein. So let's talk a little bit about what these hydrophobic forces are. This is when we have nonpolar side chains of amino acids. which cluster together 
by default. This is not an attraction between the polar side between the nonpolar side chains. Um, attraction refers to charge, and the whole thing about nonpolar side chains is they don't have a charge. However, they are stabilized with one another due to the exclusion of water. And so sort of by a default, as water orients itself away from these um, chemical structures, then they will form stability um, across one another. And again, this is due to the exclusion of water. And why this is important for protein shape, protein conformation, is that they tend to cluster in the interior of a protein. I just used the word uh, conformation. You'll see that over here. Uh, conformation is can be used interchangeably with the word shape, which is a more uh, technical term to refer especially to protein shape or other molecular structure shapes. And again, this folded conformation is uh, determined due to energetics and what the most stable shape is. And in a cell, that's always in an aqueous environment. As you know, proteins can unfold, and so the other part of this figure would be to consider uh, that this nicely folded protein can become denatured, and that is shown by this arrow here. So protein unfolding, also known as denaturation. If you're looking for this figure, it is figure 4-5 in your textbook. So let's talk a little more about protein folding. This figure is figure 4-7 in your book. Um, so protein folding and and refolding. Um, this can do can be due to um, solvents that a particular protein is exposed to, um, and these solvents disrupt the non-covalent interactions. So, question for you is: Would peptide ponds be affected? when a polypeptide chain is exposed to a solvent. So pause the video, think about your answer for that. So the answer is no, peptide bonds would not be affected. Peptide bonds are covalent uh, bonds, and thus they would not be disrupted due to the solvent. So basically the reason we're talking about this is um, when we talk about proteins that have been purified, and so we can see in this figure, here we've got a purified protein, which is folded, it's this green squiggle, that's the whole polypeptide chain. And uh, then when we purify this protein to study it in a laboratory, then uh, we may expose it to a solvent such as urea. And exposed to a high concentration of urea, uh, proteins typically will denature and then unfold. And so some of the techniques, techniques that we use, such as Western blotting, rely upon this. And so when we look more at protein uh, techniques and visualization, it will be important to know um, if they are unfolded or folded. Um, then what's interesting is, again, we're in a test tube system to try to understand this purified protein. If we remove the urea, then this protein will spontaneously refold into its original conformation. So it can occur spontaneously in a test tube. Uh, typically in a cell, This is a more challenging process, and chaperone proteins are used um, to assist in protein folding. But a cell is a lot more complex um, location than a test tube. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about significance of folding. And so one of the ways that we're trying to understand folding and to allow our bodies to function better. Um, so an example of a um, protein folding disorder
is Creutzfeld Jacob disorder, which is also known as mad cow disease. This disorder is caused by a prion. And if an individual were to ingest some of this prion, typically from some sort of tissue uh, from another animal uh, that's infected with this disorder, this prion would be present. This is an infectious protein, and it is misfolded. That's my dog, Cooper, who's uh, rooting around back there. Um, and basically, um, this particular infectious protein, when it encounters normal proteins, can cause them to misfold and become prions. And because these particular proteins that it targets are found at high quantities within neurons in the brain, then we have a, a large amount of these misfolded proteins the cell doesn't typically like misfolded proteins, and so these things start to cluster together and form an aggregate. And, um, and again, this does not allow the neuron um, or any cell to function particularly well. This can often lead to cell death. And again, this could be for particular neurons. This would lead to the production of plaques within the brain, and this impacts cognitive and or motor function. Aggregates can form for a lot of reasons, and there are also some indications that these aggregates that form in Alzheimer's disease and lead to dementia uh, may also be caused by misfolded proteins. Not prions necessarily, uh, but these are other examples for where if we could understand more about protein folding and either slow down um, or possibly reverse uh, protein misfolding disorders, then we could improve health for a lot of individuals.